My beloved brothers and sisters, it is indeed an honor to be a part of this beautiful program wherein we are discussing the various aspects of the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the best of creation, the most noble of all prophets of Allah. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him. The topic that I'm going to be speaking about is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a husband. And what we need to realize is prior to him being a husband, he obviously is the greatest of creation. Allah made him in order for him to be the final messenger, in order for him to be the Nabi or the Prophet with the greatest Ummah. And we are fortunate to be a part of that Ummah. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a great man. He was known as As-Sadiq al-Amin, something we learned when we were little in the, cases of, in the case of most of us. As-Sadiq al-Amin, meaning the truthful, the trustworthy. As a result of his truthfulness and trustworthiness, he became a husband for the first time. When I say as a result, that was one of the contributing factors. When he was in his 20s, according to the majority of the Muarrikhin or the historians and those who have documented this, he was in his 20s and he was uh, selected by Khadija binti Khuwailid radiyallahu anha to do some business and he had shown an interest in this. He went with her caravans, with her wealth to Asham, the Syrian peninsula, Asham. And subhanallah, he came back with beautiful accounts, lovely commodities and lots of profit. So that was something amazing. It was unique to have a humble person with great character, beautiful conduct, coming, a being of great benefit, so respectful, uh, so impressive in every single way. This woman who was previously married was so impressed by this man who was younger than her that against all odds, the interest was hers initially about this particular man. So she spoke to one of her relatives and said, you know what? This man is truthful, honest, respectful, hardworking. He is a great businessman in the sense that the profits are huge and he would make a brilliant husband. I want to stop there because we're talking of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, him as a husband. Remember at that time, it was still prior to prophethood. So they were not looking for the deen, but they were looking for the akhlaq still. Today we are taught when you're looking for a spouse, you look at two main things, the deen and the khuluq. If the person has outstanding religion and they have outstanding character, that's who you want as the father of your children, as an eternal uh, leader of the home, for example, uh, a, a person who will take you through to Jannatul Firdaus. Those are the qualities we are taught. But prior to Nubuwa, there were still people like Khadija radiallahu anha from a noble home, mashallah. And these noble people still looked at noble qualities. What characteristics do you have? Pause for a moment. Are you truthful? Are you honest? Are you hardworking? Are you respectful? Do you lower your gaze when you talk to the opposite gender? Have you thought about it? The Prophet sallam, well, I'm wording it respectfully. He worked for a woman who was not even related to him. He did some chores for her. He did business on her behalf and that was the agreement. This was not a mahram woman. It was a strange woman. But imagine the respect, the honor, the dignity, the interaction with the opposite sex. People ask about it. They always talk about it. There has to be interaction with the opposite sex, related or not related, either way. But it must be within the confines of Islam. Respectful. As a husband, when you're talking to women who are not related to you, remember the respect. Remember the honor and dignity that Allah has asked you to maintain. Remember not to be flirtious. Remember to be such that these people reinstate and rekindle the, the respect for men that is lost in today's society. A lot of women would say men are just a flirt. Men, no matter who they are, they're just like this. They're just like that. That stereotype needs to change because there are good men out there. So the message here is as a husband, when you're interacting with strange women, what should that interaction be limited to? It should be limited to the rules and regulations laid by Allah. Is it okay if you don't interact at all? Well, to be honest, wherever you need to, you should, you must, and you may have to, but within the limits. So that's a very powerful point. Khadija radiallahu anhu anha would have never shown an interest in the Prophet had he been a person whose 
Astaghfirullah, whose morals were not of a high standard, whose values were not exemplary. And this is why it's very interesting to look into this fact. Why was Khadija radiallahu anha so interested in this man, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, prior to prophethood? It's not a question of the deen. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu never followed the, the, the religion of his forefathers, but rather he was always on the straight and narrow. He never worshipped besides Allah. He never engaged in any form of shirk, even from the very beginning. So that was a protection from Allah. But there was no advent of Islam yet, meaning that particular prophethood had not yet commenced. Allah Almighty then inspired Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa to accept this proposal and to actually go forth and get married to this woman. He married her. Now, that puts aside a lot of the accusations that have been leveled against Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa to say he was a womanizer, he was interested in this and in that. Every time he married, there was a reason. Initially, when he married for his youth, his young age, and he wanted to get married, he got married. Who did he choose? He chose a person much older, much older, the other way. Subhanallah, but it was because she was also an amazing person. Do you think he would have married and become a husband if he did not identify this woman as an amazing woman, radiallahu anha, later to be known as? But he found in her a lot of good qualities. She was upright. She, she loved that which was upright and straight. She was honest. She, was, she spoke the truth as well. She was very trustworthy. They never had any misunderstandings. And she also spoke to him with utmost respect. Previously married. Imagine marrying a previously married woman. That was the first choice of the Prophet ﷺ from day one. Before the prophethood. Because he was looking for qualities. He found those qualities. She found the qualities in him. And there was an attempt. Let's try. Against all odds. I mean, who would have imagined here is the best of creation marrying this woman? He could have gotten any woman, any woman he wanted. In fact, later on, Quraysh told him when he was 40, Quraysh told him, you choose a woman we give you, we get you married to. Later on, still, he said, you can do what you want. I'm not moved by that. You know, these are principles. Allahu Akbar. A lot to learn even prior to the prophethood. When looking at Nabi Muhammad Wasallam as a husband. A lot to learn. Then we take a look and we fast forward. The Prophet Wasallam had his children from Khadija radiallahu anha. She was the mother of his children. He respected her. He fulfilled the duty that he had on his shoulder regarding her friends. Regarding her friends. In her lifetime as well as after her death. Later on, even... Years later, her, after her death, he used to send gifts and things to the friends of his own deceased wife, Khadija radiallahu anha. And he used to say, well, I'm fulfilling their rights. He, those are Khadija's friends, radiallahu anha. You know, you cannot compete with Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa but you have to learn a thing or two. And you have to try and put as much as you can into practice within what we as Muslim men are instructed to put into practice and Muslim women too. So Khadija radiallahu anha was a source of comfort to Muhammad sallallahu How many of the women out there are a source of comfort to their husbands? She literally supported him. She considered him the leader of the home even though she was older. He was the Amir of the house. The decisions were always made by the Amir of the house. That was Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Subhanallah. And he listened to what she had to say. He always took into consideration what she had to say. And then ultimately a decision was made. There came a time when he was so fed up with the bad that was happening in society. And he knew his wife was not upon that bad. His wife was different. But his family, extended family, etc. From his relatives, they were engaged in association of partners with Allah in shirk. The major shirk. And they used to engage in lots of misbehavior, bad things. It was known as Al-Jahiliya, probably the worst from among what was happening on earth. You know, when Allah sent the messenger, he sent to those who were in the Jahiliya itself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He used to meditate. She supported that meditation. She used to support him in everything. She used to speak to him with respect, listen to what he has to say. If he comes home and he says something, she would comfort him. How do we know this? Well, there are so many narrations that make mention of it. And the mere fact that the day Jibreel alayhi salam came to him in the cave and told him Iqra and what happened thereafter, he came running down that particular mount from the cave and 
Who did he go to? Subhanallah. When a husband has a matter to discuss, who does he discuss it with first? A very important matter today in your lives. My brothers, my sisters, when a wife has a matter to discuss, who does she discuss it with? Are you the type of mature person whom whatever your spouse is to confide in you with, you would process it correctly, you would give the correct advice, you would help and you would be an asset? Or are you the type of spouse whom you are the last person who would get to know what's going on in the life of your spouse? Very interesting question. Imagine if your spouse has a habit that whatever happens, they can't wait to let you know. They can't wait to let you know in order for you to assist. It does not mean in Islam you need to tell your spouse everything. There are certain things you don't need to tell them. Not everyone needs to know everything, including your spouse. They don't need to know every detail. But when something important happens, how much do you trust your spouse? And to what extent is a spouse going to comfort you or you going to be a comfort to your spouse. It's a very important matter worth pondering over. Think about it. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as a husband, he was not ashamed to come down to his wife and say, Zammiluni, Zammiluni, or Dathiruni, etc. You know, cover me, envelop me. I need that tight hug, for example, or I need to be covered. People would be ashamed, shy to say, what hug do you need? Yeah, go to your wife and say, I need a hug. What do you need a hug for? Subhanallah, I need to be covered. And what did Khadija radiallahu anha do? She immediately covered. Not what happened? Where were you? Come here, explain yourself. No, there was a beautiful environment in the home. This is just as Nubuwa commenced. She said, Kalla wallahi la yukhzikallahu abada. Nay, never. It's impossible for Allah to let you down ever. It cannot happen that Allah lets you down. Allah will not do that to you. Why? Because you are a good man. You are so beautiful. You fulfill the rights of others. You take care of your family. You take care of your relationships. You help the poor, the needy. You help the orphans, the widows. You are there to help the people on the streets, the sickly, whoever else. And she started mentioning all the good qualities of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Amazing. Amazing. She is mentioning the good qualities of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa saying very clearly that, you know what? Allah will not let you down. Now, remember, they were not Muslim in, in that sense in the city, in Mecca. They were not Muslim. But the Prophet ﷺ was always on the straight and narrow. He worshipped Allah alone. His spouse, the same, subhanAllah. She was not one of those who was from the ignorance of the ignorant or the ignorant of the ignorance. No, she was a great woman. She says, no, let me take you to my relative here, Waraka, a cousin of mine who's actually well-versed in these type of things, and let's go and ask him. And she made the effort to take her spouse. Remember, he was younger, indeed, with utmost respect. You don't make them feel, oh, you know what, as it is, I'm older than you. No, age was never, ever mentioned. Subhanallah. Thereafter, it was never an issue, never mentioned in that way. He goes with Khadija radiallahu anha. They sit with the cousin and they hear the story. They say it and they hear what he has to say. And you know what? He was already told that, subhanAllah, your people will turn against you. If what you said is true, your people will turn against you. And the day you are asked to convey the message, I hope that I will be alive. But unfortunately, he passed on. What? Now, the Prophet Sallallahu as a husband, let's fast forward. He had his children. They had a beautiful upbringing. His children were with Khadija radiallahu anha. And that was an amazing relationship. He did not marry another woman in the lifetime of Khadija radiallahu anha. Allah had planned that in order for the support that was needed for Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be given by this particular chosen woman who is our mother, the mother of the believers Khadija bint Khuwailid radiyallahu tabaraka wa ta'ala anha. Allah chose her for a purpose. This is why your spouse, Allah will choose both of you for a purpose. There is a purpose you will fulfill, either a good one or a bad one. Make dua, it's a good one. Make dua, it is a purpose that will make you earn Jannatul Firdaus as a result. So you get to Jannah as a result, not you get to Jahannam. Some people get married. The spouses take them in the wrong direction. That is a purpose. You lost. You're supposed to take your spouse into the right direction. Don't become sad when your spouse is asking you to become closer to Allah because that is what your success would ultimately be through the mercy of Allah. When your spouse is asking you to do things that would be pleasing to Allah, don't be upset. Nabi Sallallahu had a beautiful relationship with Khadija Anha. Later, she passed away. When she passed away, he was very sad. 
He was very sad because he lost a great human being. So much so that two or three things happened in that year. It was known as Amul Huzn, the year of sadness. It was known as the year of sadness. One year, one whole year, known as the year of sadness. That was the time when the Prophet ﷺ went to Ta'if as well. And subhanAllah, he lost his wife, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. He lost his uncle, the uncle Abu Talib, who was looking after him. That year of sadness. But then the Prophet ﷺ was taken to Mi'raj. And subhanAllah, thereafter he got married. And every time he married thereafter, there was a purpose. It was not in order to fulfill his desires, his base desires, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That wasn't a primary objective, but there were objectives connected to so many things that Allah had ordained and inspired him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted the deen to be carried on, to be taken all the way to us. Hence the marriage to Aisha radiallahu anha and, and, and the others. Aisha radiallahu anha as young and intelligent Someone who would ask many questions, someone who would not only witness what was happening, but register it and process it and convey it. That was one of the main purposes of the marriage with Aisha radiallahu anha. Otherwise, they hardly lived together for, for a long time. Subhanallah. But she came in for a purpose. Like I said, if you don't know the purpose, go and study it. Here is Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He loved his spouses and he was not afraid to express that love. One day they asked him, who do you love the most? Imagine the Nabi of Allah, a pious, pious, the most pious. In me, he used to say, I am the most God-fearing from amongst you. Atqaakum lillah. I'm the most God-conscious from amongst you. And they asked him, imagine asking a very pious person, who do you love the most? And he looks up to you and says, my wife. And he says the name, Aisha. Allahu Akbar. As a husband, he did that. He did that. Who do you love the most? Aisha. Then who? A father. Subhanallah. Amazing. If you look at that, how many of us are afraid to express the love? You Forget about telling someone else, I love my wife so much. But you tell her. We don't even tell her that I love you so much. Or him, the other way around. Because remember, although we're talking about Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu as a husband, his teachings are beneficial, obviously, for the women too. So to be able to tell your spouse, I love you so much. I really love you. I love you the most. Why not? It's, it's from Allah in your heart. And you can love someone the most from different angles. Subhanallah. So you have your fatherly love. You have your siblings. You have your uh, children. And you have your spouse. The love is different angles of love. So you might love your spouse the most in terms of the, the spousal love and you love your mother the most in terms of your parental love, for example. It's a different type of love. But my brothers, my sisters, talking of general love, he declared it, he said it. As a husband, he would mention it and he wouldn't be ashamed. Also, as a husband, he had beautiful nicknames for his wives. He would call them something that they would love. He would call them a nice name. Subhanallah. And it was vice versa. It was vice versa. So sometimes the women say, oh, you know, the Prophet ﷺ had a nickname for his wives. Why don't you have a nickname for me? My dear sister, why don't you have a nickname for your husband too? Call him something nice. He will appreciate. Yes, it's not wrong. Okay, one might argue, well, this is not compulsory. Nobody is saying it's compulsory. We're talking of how he did it. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But you'll get a reward of a sunnah if your intention is correct. That was the Prophet ﷺ. I tell you one other thing. He used to feed his wife with his own hands. Today we would say, no, your hands are dirty. Number two is, he said it's an act of charity to feed your wife. An act of charity. So yes, to bring along the food and to feed the family is definitely also an act of charity. It's a duty. Something over and above that is to take a moment to put a hand, romantically feed them. There. Similarly, what he did with Aisha, عنها, he would drink from the same part of the utensil that she drank from, looking for the place. He would drink it and he would make sure she blushed as a result. I'm shy. Subhanallah. You become shy because you're full of love. And you know what? You're full of respect at the same time. And we have something very interesting. Even when they had the, the food that she would bite into, he would look for the place she bit and he would bite. Meaning they shared their food. People might argue, well, there is a virus at the moment and there is this and that. My brother, my sister, the sunnah is the sunnah. Subhanallah. That's your spouse. You live with your spouse. But yes, our mouths are kept clean because sometimes we get complaints to say, oh, this guy's mouth is smelling and he doesn't keep clean, he doesn't. The Prophet ﷺ used to siwak five times a day. He used to clean his teeth five times a day and more sometimes, you know, every salah. And he used to say, Lawla 
أن أشق على أمتي لا أمرتهم بالسواك عند كل صلاة. If if it was not going to be made difficult for my ummah, I would have asked them to clean their teeth for every salah with a miswak. Subhanallah, Subhanallah. That's why you see people who want to fulfill that sunnah. They have a siwak in the pocket just before they start salah. They clean their teeth so that they can start off that salah with a beautiful teeth and clean mouth. Cleaning the mouth is a very very important point that we need to make sure. Being clean in your marital home is something very important. Be it your outward cleanliness, your inward cleanliness, the removal of the pubic hairs, the maintaining of your private parts and your areas. Don't be ashamed to talk about it because it is a sunnah to maintain that cleanliness. Do you know that one could actually ask for a divorce or to get divorced if the husband was unclean or vice versa? If they're unclean, to what level is that uncleanliness? If they're really beyond what Allah has asked and required, then you, indeed, I mean, this person is filthy. They don't even clean themselves. How do you expect someone to live with them in nikah, to be intimate with them? The Prophet ﷺ was so clean and smart and so were all those whom we know about. There was no complaint amongst them ever. And he taught us, you must remove the pubic hair. You must do this. You must clean thoroughly when you've used the loo and so on. That's part of Islam, the one of the first things you learn. Why should we be ashamed to mention this? So as a husband, maintain the cleanliness. We would like our wives to dress for us. We need to dress for our, our wives as well. We need to make sure we are presentable. When they look at us, they feel, wow, that's my man. That is my man, subhanAllah. Look at how smart he is. Look at how well kept he is. Look at how well groomed he is and so on. MashaAllah, my man. Sometimes people are ashamed to associate with us. Simply because we look like people who just couldn't care. We couldn't be bothered. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, these are teachings people don't normally mention. Here we are talking about them. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to also speak to his wives in a beautiful way where they would, they would realize this man is making us laugh and at the same time he is making a point and he's giving an example sometimes in a way. For example, asked about the love. He tells Aisha radiallahu anha, it's like, it's like a knot. So when you pull the knot, it becomes tighter and tighter and tighter. And the only thing we're doing here is pulling. So this love becomes stronger and stronger. That's just an example, figurative speech. Because he wants to, he wants to speak to her in a way that she would be happy. She would understand. Okay, fine. You know? Sometimes uh, people say, okay, you love me. How much do you love me? You know? And instead of putting your hands all the way around, which is also okay. But you can explain it in a beautiful way. And let's take it in a correct way too. Alhamdulillah. Then the Prophet ﷺ used to sometimes do some things that would make his wives happy, meaning his, he would do certain things that would make them happy, not from that which is haram, but that which is permissible. Aisha radiallahu anha says that she used to like to watch these uh, Habashi boys uh, play sometimes. So he covered her uh, in, in a little cloak and he would stand with her. He would stand with her from a distance and uh, make sure she, she watched them play and then he would take her away, subhanAllah, in a nice way. Just to make her happy. Okay, that's it. Subhanallah. Wow. I might not want to do something, but because my wife wants to do it, or my family wants to do it, or my husband wants to do it, so I will come out and do it for his sake or for her sake to make them happy. And the intention is that happiness is following the sunnah and that sunnah is earning a reward with Allah. So sometimes you may have to do certain things. The Prophet ﷺ kissed his spouses. When he kissed Aisha radiallahu anha, in fact, he says that even in, in the condition of fasting, the Prophet ﷺ has kissed Aisha. She mentions this as well. Kissed his wives. And he could control himself. I mean, if you're going to lose yourself and during the fast, you're not supposed to go beyond a certain point, but a kiss is permissible for as long as you're controlling yourself. For as long as you know it's not going to arouse you, it's fine. Subhanallah. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ also used to lay on her lap and vice versa. He used to bathe with the same water. That's something amazing. I mean, think about it. Bathing with the same water. It's not deeply explained, but it could mean a few things. And all of it is applicable. It's all permissible. It shows that affection. It shows the trust. It shows the, 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 the beautiful relationship. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's our role model. The Prophet has played games sometimes. Or recreation. He has actually uh, taken his spouse out in order to do certain things. Aisha radiallahu anha makes mention of the racing now, although this didn't happen every day, and it might not have been so regular, but it did happen. I mean, once in a while you're going on vacation, you can have a little bit of fun here and there. That is an ibadah. People think, why is this guy doing it? Especially when you're a sheikh, or especially when you're a religious person. But you should. In fact, the more religious you are, one of the characteristics is you become romantic with the right people. 
Notice the last words, the right people. Because when you're not religious and when you're not conscious of Allah, you are romantic, but with the wrong people. When you're conscious, you become romantic with the right people. And this love and affection is felt. And this connection is felt so deep. It's just amazing. This is the Prophet ﷺ. He raced with Aisha radiallahu anha. They were on the horses. Mention is made of how at, there was a time when one of his wives said, I don't want to ride on this horse because it's too slow. I need a fast horse. So he stopped the caravan and put her onto the fastest horse. And then, he, are you happy? Yes, now I'm very happy. Imagine you got two or three cars and your wife says, no, I want to go in the fastest car. Would you ever think that if the Prophet ﷺ was there, he would stop everything and say, okay, come, come. Let's take you in the faster one. Why not? If that's what's going to make you happy, what are you losing? That doesn't mean he was not the Amir of the home. He was not the leader of the home. He was the leader. He called the shots. He made the decisions. But he always considered what was said. He protected his family. وسلم, he provided for them. And they were happy with whatever he provided. You know what Aisha radiallahu anha says something amazing. Because people think, oh, that's the Prophet ﷺ. He must have been, he was the best of creation, the most noble of all prophets of Allah. He is. But materially, there was a stage when the Prophet ﷺ didn't have that much. So when we talk, some people say he didn't have much. Some people say he had everything. Those were different stages in his life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Aisha radiallahu anha says, in kunna ala Muhammadin. Do you know what that means? Even though we were the family of the Prophet. So she's about to say something that you wouldn't have expected because she's saying even though we were the family of the Prophet of Allah, we had no food in our home. We saw the moon, we saw another moon, we saw a third moon, which means three months in a row. And you know what? The only thing we had was tamr wal ma, dates and water. Did they complain? The answer is no. Did they say, my husband can't provide? Look at him, we're just eating dates and water. They were happy because do you know what? There are days when you may not have and there are days when you will have. A man's test is when he has everything. And a woman's test is when she, a woman's test is when he has nothing. Have you thought of that? Okay, that's not something Islamic, but it's just something from, from what we've seen on earth. A woman is tested. In fact, even from an Islamic perspective, a woman is tested when the husband doesn't have much or loses things. Then that's your test. Are you going to stay? Are you going to... You may. You have a right beyond a certain point to ask out if really your rights are being affected. But if you're patient, perhaps that man might get so much more. You've had so many years of goodness. Now there will be years of... A little time of tough, perhaps, years. And then you'll have a lot of goodness again. Are you prepared to stay for a good man? The answer should be, yes, I would. For a good man, I would. If he's not a good man, it's another thing. You're not obliged to remain when your rights are not being fulfilled. You can ask for a nullification or you can ask for a separation or, or even a talaq. May Allah make it easy for all of us. But the point here is they, they went through hardship with pleasure because of the goodness of the man. He's got deen, he's got character. He's trying to earn, gen well, he's trying to earn the pleasure of Allah. He was earning the pleasure of Allah. He is part of those who are going to enter Jannah. In fact, the first who will enter. In fact, we will enter through his intercession. So if you're looking at it that way, then obviously he is number one, right at the top there. May Allah grant us his intercession and may Allah grant us his companionship as well in the hereafter. I can't wait to actually sit and talk and find out more and see and look at his beautiful face, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Beyond that, obviously, the ultimate would be to see Allah Almighty. May Allah make it easy for us and grant us that day. I mean, this is an example when we talk about these things, when we deliver lectures and when we are saying what the Prophet ﷺ was as a husband. If you are not going to derive lessons and change yourselves, then we are wasting our time. You, you learn, you, you compare with your own lives and you change your life in accordance with what you've learned. Watch your tongue. The Prophet ﷺ never swore. And later on in his life, he always said, whoever curses is actually going to earn the displeasure of Allah. So he, he didn't even curse. There was a point when Allah allowed him to curse certain enemies. But then he stopped and he said, no, this is not something that a mu'min would do. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi helped in the home. Yes, indeed. With what? He helped with the cooking and the cleaning. Not every day, but a lot of the time. So if you take a careful study of that time, there was nothing hard and fast as to who must cook. It became a cultural matter later. And yes, indeed, there are people who would fulfill the roles. People say, well, you know, you got to bring the food. I'll bring the food, but you got to help me cook it. You can ask your spouse and it's, it's a bonus. The happiest homes are the homes where the spouses know their roles. But assist each other a little bit in your role. The, the, I'll go out and work whole day, so I'm going to be really, really tired and so on, I'll expect you to do a little bit while you're at home. 
either way. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. And sometimes if both are away, maybe we might be able to collectively afford something that uh, perhaps would help us eat. Maybe someone who can cook for us, then we can pay them. Or perhaps food that is already prepared by a third party and we can pay and have it. Whatever it may be, learn to understand each other. When I go back and look at the, the, the seerah, and the little that I read just to prepare for this particular talk, I can tell you that the Prophet ﷺ assisted and helped when it came to the milking of the goats, that means the milking and bringing the milk and whatever else. Today we have milk and bread. When it came to assisting in cooking and so on, they would cook to this day. You know, There are a lot of people who, who are good chefs who are males. In fact, some of the best chefs on earth are males. But we make it taboo simply because we're culturally contaminated in a lot of cases. And we consider it a religious matter just because it suits us. It's very difficult to come out of that. I'm not at all trying to change your situation in your own home. But I am saying, my beloved brothers, try and help a little bit more. Try and clean up. Don't make a big mess. Intentionally make sure. Try and help clean up. I can speak about myself. I've started helping from a while. A little bit here and there. It makes such a big difference. And you can. It's so easy. It would take a few minutes if we both tried to do this together. But if you just left it on one, it's a big mission. Subhanallah. Either way, and my beloved sisters, support your spouses. Make life easy for them. Try and help them in whatever they're doing. Look at Khadija radiallahu anha. She sent the Prophet sallam before Nubuwa to, to do the business. He did the business. He brought in the money. Even though she was the one who outlaid the, 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 the capital. Even, even though the money ultimately belonged to her. But he was earning a handsome profit. And everything was done beautifully. So if one does this, the other one can do that. And we can both help each other fulfill our roles. So my brothers, my sisters, we've mentioned a lot of points and I've actually said quite a few fact, uh, quite a few things. I want to end off with a beautiful reminder that you all probably know. It's a hadith where the Prophet ﷺ says, خيركم خيركم The best from amongst you are those who are best to their wives. He didn't stop there. He says, وَأَنَا خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِهِ And I am the best to his wife. Actually means to his family. I'm the best. Family here, wife, children to start with, and then your broader family. Why did he say that I am the best? Because that means anything he did or said, we need to learn from. Another quick point that's come to my mind, the expression on your face needs to be positive. Both husband and wife. Don't come into the home and have a face that gives an impression that you are so sad and upset, and yet you're not. Make an effort to smile. If smiling on the face of a strange uh, brother is actually an ibadah, for the brothers and the sisters for the sisters. If, if it's an ibadah for a stranger, what about your spouse? It is a far greater act of worship. So make an effort. Come home. Say good words. Don't get angry. If not getting angry is a great act of worship, then don't get angry starting at home. Do you know getting angry is actually haram? To get angry in this way with, the, with people for no reason. It's prohibited. La taghdab. That means don't get angry. That is the advice of the Prophet ﷺ. He repeated it so many times. La taghdab, la taghdab, la taghdab. According to a narration, the Sahaba says, radiallahu anhum, that uh, sakata. We wish that we could have said, oh, I hope that now he, it's enough. I hope he, he, he can keep quiet on that one. You know, Meaning we've got the point. But no, he repeated it again and again because people get angry with your spouse. Start screaming and yelling. Stop it. Cut it. Start understanding who you are. You're a part of the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu You're supposed to follow his example and his footsteps. You're supposed to be uh, an amazing human being. You're supposed to try to be one. Cut out the screaming, the yelling, the shouting, the abusive language, the lies, the falsehood, the cheating, the deceiving. They trusted him completely, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it was a beautiful, amazing relationship. So here goes. Are you part of the ummah? Make an effort to follow. Make an effort to learn. Make an effort to change your lives. Husbands and wives. It's about time we did something about what we know. You expand your knowledge. Whatever I said today, I'm sure you know. But one thing that we're lacking is when it comes to have you changed your life? What are you doing? Did you change? Subhanallah. May Allah Almighty grant us all goodness. May Allah... Uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us and make us from the best of the best of people may Allah almighty help us improve ourselves may Allah help us fulfill the rights of our spouses with respect with dignity may Allah make us focus on the akhirah and on jannah rather than focusing on petty material things of this world this world does not equate even the weight of the wing of a fly in the eyes of Allah so what are you stressed about subhanallah no need to stress over the dunya May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an improved relationship such that together we can earn Jannatul Firdaus.